Well, welcome to the uh, Epping Bag Show, and uh, we'll be here again for the next hour. And of course, I'm joined as usual here on a Tuesday night, as it is this, uh, as it is, as you're seeing this. Uh, of course, top left hand corner. Of course, the one and only uh, little physio in the top corner. How are we, mate? I'm very good, thank you. Yeah, very good. A few days, and then of course, in the bottom right hand corner, Ems is down in the bottom right hand corner. How are you, mate? Hello, everyone. And I suppose happy anniversary to you in a, a, a in a good anniversary that we were just talking about off air. Yes, thank you very much. It's my <laughs> scars one year anniversary. So happy days with that. Happy days with that. But of course, our special guest tonight. Uh, of course, would you like to introduce in Emily? I mean, I'll let you uh, over to you to introduce our very special guest uh, uh, this evening. David, it's unlike you to hand over the reins, but. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce a um, bit of a legend in the football world. Uh, works, does a lot of work with fans for diversity and is my old gaffer, Anwar. Good evening. Good evening. How are we, sir? I was very impressed with that intro little bit, that montage. It was like a proper movie. I was like, this is serious. That, that's, all, <laughs> that, that's all David yeah. over there, mate. Nothing to do with us. Yeah. I do, I do a lot of this stuff. I do a lot of these talks, and that's pretty one of the best sort of intros. I'm thinking I, I better up my game here tonight. You know what? And what? I like you already. And you haven't wall shamed us too badly as well, like getting all your medals and that hour. We're, we're very happy with this so far. Well, the medals are all downstairs in the basement. They need their own room. So I, Fair <laughs> enough, mate. <laughs> Ali, 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 you can start your fangirling now. Anwar played for West Ham. I know. I, I won't lie. I've, I've, I've had a wee Google. I won't lie. <laughs> A little, a little one. Fangirling. It's rude not to, Amwar, isn't it? It's really rude not to when you've got a guest coming on. Now, listen, it's this research, isn't it? It's what you've got yeah. to do. But I must admit, though, I was, I was actually sitting there myself looking at that and thinking, oh, I do like these intros. I must admit, even though I did it myself, I was sitting there, I was sitting there, sort of saying, I really, like, one, I really like this. You've changed that. Where's the one of me having to go with the ref on? No, we had bad complaints, Ems. We had complaints from refs, mate. No, it's exactly, it's exactly <laughs> the same. I haven't changed anything. It was actually, oh. it disappeared. No idea. It was there somewhere, but it flashed off. So, so and, uh, tell, me, tell us, I mean, what, what are you up to uh, at, at the minute? I mean, for people that don't know and, uh, uh, you know, just be interested to, you know, for them to know what you're, you're, you're doing at the minute. Yeah, so currently, I'm the assistant manager of Aldershot Town Football Club. And um, I also am the Fans for Diversity Campaigns Manager for the Football Supporters Association and Kick It Out. So when, everyone, when anyone asks me, like, what's your job title, what do you do, I do have to take a bit of a breath because then they're like, okay, what's Fans for Diversity? Uh, and that basically is a campaign that kind of wants to make football as inclusive as possible. How can we get more people watching, playing, refereeing, working in the game? Number one. And number two, how can we just make football as welcome as possible? Because it's a great sport that can, I mean, it's given me an amazing opportunity in my life. It's given me a life that I could only dream of. So I want every young boy and girl to have the same opportunity that I had. And that's basically a snapshot of what Fans for Diversity is, giving an opportunity to everyone to embrace football for what it is. Can I hit you with a really sort of big question? Because it's one of these questions that's been buzzing around in my head sort of for the last couple of days. And, and since uh, you, you've seen all this uh, sort of uh, blackout of, of, of social media. And how much, how much of an effect do you think that the actual, the, this blackout over the weekend is actually going to, you know, mean to the, to, to the cause as such? I mean, is it, is it I, I, not, not so far as going to say a waste of time, but, you know, do, do you think it's going to make any difference whatsoever by shutting down you know, social media streams for everybody from Friday to that three o'clock right the way through till, uh, till Monday evening. Do you think it's going to make a difference? In all honesty, I don't think it's going to make a big difference, no. Um, you know, it's, it's a big, big problem. And with big problems, I don't know anyone who's got a magic wand that can wave it and then it's all fixed. So to be honest, it's going to take a long time. It's going to take loads of little different things. But ultimately, it's going to take people looking in a mirror, people looking at their own workplaces, their own teams, their own friends, and actually looking at how they can all do more. Because I've been talking about this my whole life and not much has changed, if I'm honest. In fact, it just evolves. So discrimination, you know, when I was a kid growing up, it was in your face. You know, people looked or dressed a certain way and they spoke to you in a certain way. 
Nowadays, it's changed. Nowadays, it could all be online, but it still exists. So in terms of the blackout, I don't think it's going to make a major effect. No, but what it will do is it will spark discussions, which is a good thing. And actually, it will give people something to think about because there'll be some people who are oblivious to the issues in football. But then this weekend, penultimate weekend of the championship, big games in the WSL, big games across all of the divisions, really, when they're going to go on social media to check the scores and stuff, they're not going to be able to do that. So they'll ask why. So they'll, they'll be interested. They'll look into it. And um, as part of my role, I've met fans over the last five years all up and down the country that have been involved in incidents. So I've met victims. I've met perpetrators. I've delivered education. And a lot of people are oblivious as to the impact of what a tweet, a DM, mm. at what you know, a chant on the terraces. They're oblivious of the impact that can have. Mm. So maybe, just maybe, if this blackout over this weekend makes a, a few people think, and to be fair, I think it's, it's, it's served its purpose. I mean, I saw one this morning that was uh, on Sky Sports. And I, 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 you know when you normally get some, and some of these sort of stories and they don't really hit you um, at all. You, and then you get one story that sort of really hits you hard. And I was, I was getting ready for work this morning and, I, and they were interviewing a, a gentleman that was playing for Albion. I think it was Albion in Scotland uh, or at one, one of the clubs up there. And they were playing Stenhouse Muir. And I don't know if you've seen it on Sky Sports today. And the, and the young man had, had attempted um, to kill himself. Um, at some point, and he was on the bench uh, playing against Stenhouse Muir uh, last night, I think it must have been, and um, somebody's actually come up to him and said something to him on the bench about try uh, better luck next time or something along those sort of lines to him, and the lad's got up and just stormed off, come off the bench and gone straight into his van and, and driven home and done like a Facebook uh, message, the Facebook Live sort of message on his, on his stream. Uh, going home last night, you know, and and that one really sort of hit me this morning. I'll be honest, I was sitting there having, you know, eating my breakfast, getting ready for work and saw that on there. And it was just something that's not as simple as that, but just a, a straightforward story that really sort of hit home a little bit, you know, with, with, with that with that side of it. And, you know, they're both saying, are we going to investigate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you could see that the, the young man was really distraught. And the first thing I thought of was I wanted to pick the phone up and phone him to see if he was okay. And I know that sounds really silly, but that was the first thing that came to my mind was pick up a phone and call the guy. You know, I don't know the guy from Adam. I wouldn't even know where to find his number, but, you know, pick up that phone and actually call him and say to him, are you okay? Because it was a real sort of like, you know, I don't know, it just really hit me hard this morning. But do you find there's certain stories from, you, you know, ladies and, and what do you find there's certain stories like that that actually really do hit you as well? I think, David, it's always the simple ones that get you, isn't it? Because it's the simplicity of the and the banality of it that makes you think, why is this happening? I think I've had my own instance with like social media and, and, and negativity. And I think it, what strikes me is rather than having a geezer in a stand shout at you, for someone to come into your own home and abuse you is something different. You know, um, I think my, mine's um, mainly because I'm female, sadly. It seems to be unfair game in some people's eyes. And... I think sadly, it's it's social media has, has got a lot of and, and um, people, people can hide behind their keyboards. They don't realise that what impact they're having. They think it's just words, but it's never words, is it? To you, sadly. I, mean, I don't know about the other two guys here, but for me, it's always like it's, it's idea of someone coming into your house and shouting at you or calling you something or you know abusing you. It, it's horrible, isn't it? You know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I um, like I said, I've, I've actually sat down with individuals that have been involved in these incidents. Hmm. Actually, wrote messages and DMs and. Sometimes people are oblivious. They're like, I've only got 16 followers or not many friends on Facebook. But what, what my point is, anything you write down on social media, you might as well go into the town centre, get a loudspeaker system and scream it because everyone will find out, everyone will see it. And I think a lot of people are not, don't realise the power of social media. You know what, it's actually crazy because I meet people now that follow me on Twitter and I follow them, for example, and you, you bump into it and you think, I've not seen this person for a few years. They know everything you're doing. Oh, that was wicked you did the other day. Oh, you bought that red car. I like that what you did to your house. You're sitting there thinking, Man, this, is, this is quite crazy, but this is the world we live in. Mm. And I think social media is playing a massive role in that. And people just don't realise the impact. And um, talking about your experience, as you were saying, I've got some friends now that are doing a lot of punditry on uh, Sky, on BBC. And... For a woman to go and stand in that position, 
talk on behalf of the game tactically, talk about transfers, clubs, the lead. That is brilliant. And some of my friends have gone on to do that. It makes me feel proud to see them go from playing in the WSL to standing up on Sky and talking next to the likes of Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher and Alan Shearer and Gary Neville. Because for me, that's the sign of the times. But some of the abuse that, that some of the pundits get, for me, I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, what does that, is that a shine to encourage more female pundits to go ahead and do that? This is brilliant. It'll be a great career. When some of the abuse they get is, 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 is simply unacceptable. So this is why I think we're having this discussion because it, it has to change. I think people need to be aware of the impact it has. I completely it agree, different. Anwar, completely. I think I, I did a podcast for the unorthodox guys and we discussed a lot about sort of, to, to give it a small title, sex and performance. And I said to them, they, it's hard when I have young girls watch me go, I want to be a physio. For me to go, yeah, it's great, but you've got to get a thick skin quickly because you're going to get it, unfortunately. And I, I'm mixed race, so maybe I get it from both ends, sadly, that if you don't fit what people want you to fit, sometimes you get a lot of abuse for it. And I think I think it's sad that in what, 12, 13 years of football, I'm, I'm still hearing it and you're still getting it. I think now with social media, it gets a little bit closer to you than it used to. I, I find personally, I don't know about the other guys on, on the call, but I find it gets it, get, it, get, it gets into you a lot quicker. And I mean, what's the answer? Do I go private? Do I turn off my social media? Or do they just behave themselves? Which seems like the simplest option to me personally, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still speechless from Dave's story, saying mm-hmm. that someone walked up to a guy saying, better luck next time after you attempted suicide. Like, mm-hmm. who, do, who? what human being gets out of bed in the morning and thinks that's exactly what I'm going to say? Mm-hmm. That's, oh, it, has, it makes me so cross. And it's like, when I was on the on, on Autographs podcast as well, Ali, um, we spoke openly about racism um, because, unfortunately, it's not easy for me to admit, but my dad is a massive racist. He's just, it's embarrassing. Like, racist, homophobic. He calls himself old school. He's not. He's ignorant and racist, and it's just unacceptable. But that's something I have to live with. I mean, that's not me, but still something that's following me around, unfortunately. I think one key thing to think about is that and like with the work that I do, they kick it out in the FSA. Like we don't want to sanitize football. Like we don't want to make it something that it's not. Because a lot of people think, oh, the game's changing. You can't say this. You can't do that. I love the tension, the aggressiveness, the rivalry, the tribalism. I love all that. But people need to be aware. There's a line that you can't cross. Because if you cross that line, actually, what you're doing, what you're saying, is actually illegal and it's a crime. And I think that's where some people are oblivious to it. I think one thing I always say is that we have to understand we live in the world as it is, not how we wish it to be. So, you know, like people are surprised sometimes by hearing like what you said, David, about today's story. Like, unfortunately, this this still happens and it will do. I mean, there was players I know that lost their children, lost their children, had some time off, went to play in a game and had fans abusing the fact that they'd lost their child. Like for me, that like, like, and that's unfortunately there's a minority of human beings that we will always have because, you know, that's just that's just life. But for me, it's about making sure the critical mass of people of society understand that actually, 2021 now we need to move with the times because let's not be stuck in the 60s and 70s like some countries around the world. I mean, I must admit though, I mean, I've been involved with like non-league football now for I don't know nine, ten years, and and I can't. I, I struggle to even think about one incident that I can, or maybe one incident where someone's, you know, called out someone being racist or, or hearing anything from the crowd or, or anything like that whatsoever in that, in that period of time. Now, I might be naive, I don't know. I mean, it, it might just be me that I've not heard it. But do you think it's, it's more um, prevalent in the, seat, you know, in the full-time game than it is in non-league? Or do you think it's, it's just, it's, it's there, but people just don't, do anything about it in non-league football? I think I, th- I think it's hard to sort of distinguish between the Premier League, the, the Championship, and non-league because ultimately, all the people that walk in the terraces are the same. Mm. You know, like anyone can be a fan of Cray Wanderers, and anyone can be a fan of West Ham United. So it's hard to distinguish. There is a lot more support and understanding at the time level, obviously, because of the money and the resources. But I think people tend to forget that, like. Football is actually a good place. There's a lot of wicked people in football. There's a lot of people that make you feel welcome. There's a lot of people that want to do the right things. And if something did happen, they'd call it out, they'd challenge it. But unfortunately, like everything in life, it's always the minority. It's always 
the crazy shocking stories which we've discussed always take the headlines and you could be at a club for 10 years, years at all. one big issue and all of a sudden that club has a bit of a reputation so like I said there's loads of good people in, 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 in football and I think sometimes we shouldn't get too kind of like taken away with the, the negatives and let's not forget about the positive. The thing is though whether it's non-league or professional football I've heard it time and time again through the years in football people say like past comments and you go easy mate and they go I paid my money it's like that doesn't give you the right to be aggressive that doesn't give you a right to abuse someone like that's it's not you paid a fee to abuse someone you paid a fee to watch football and I just don't understand the people mentality of going I paid nine pounds to get in here I can do what I like no you can't you can't abuse people who have come to play football and entertain you it's it's a mentality I can't get my head around. Yeah, no, that's that's true. And to be fair as well, what I've heard as well, as you know, you know, football players they earn so much money they should be able to deal with it. That's the most senseless comment I've ever heard. So if you earn a hundred pound a week and you earn twenty thousand pound a week, does that somehow make you immune to racism or immune to, mm. to homophobia or sexism? It doesn't at all. Mm. Someone said to someone said to me someone said to me if if if, if it's as bad as it as it is. You know, why Why are the clubs, the senior clubs, not turning around to their players and saying, right, you shouldn't be on social media. You've all got to come off social media. That it's because they're not in the wrong, David. Out. They're not in the wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm quite passionate about this. Yeah. Hmm. If I will, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the argument of a short skirt and a woman means she's asking for it, right? Yeah. So I can't wear a short skirt because somebody else can't control their own behaviour. And it's the same with social media. You know, do I come off of it because a man just sent a picture of in this picture of, of, of himself? No, that's not my problem. That's his problem. I really feel strongly that actually people should just mind their own business. And if and like, you know what, people are allowed to have their viewpoints. They're allowed to be whatever they want to be in life. But you do not have the right to throw that at somebody else. So if you want to be racist, that's cool. Just keep it to yourself, isn't it? <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> that. That's my viewpoint. I don't know anyone else's, but that's, that's how the I feel. Is, Ali. You know, when you get those pictures, please name and shame and tag the shit out of them. Uh, you know what? I will. I, 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 honestly, I'll block the geezer, but you know, it is what it is, isn't it? No, name and shame. <laughs> Do you know what? I don't think I want to put him through it. And that's, that's, that's the honest truth. I, think, I don't think he understood what he had done. That makes sense. And it is what it is. But I, I just feel like it's that little thing of that like, I would never, I, if I was going to send somebody anything, I would always think, how would that affect them? How would me saying that affect somebody else? I think not everybody thinks like that, Sal. I mean, as you were saying, Anwar, not everyone thinks, how do my actions impact on somebody, do you know? And that's oh, the people question, just, isn't it? Yeah, people just shoot from the hip, don't they, sometimes? I think where football is so emotive, the team loses on a Tuesday night to last minute, like we did this week, actually. You know, you're <laughs> angry, you're angry. It's, you know, get rid of the manager, get rid of the players. And it's, but that's fine. You know what? That's fine. Give me, as the, as the assistant manager or the player, all the abuse you want. But don't, why are you going to bring up my race, my ethnicity, my parents, or, you know, who I'm married to? That's got nothing to do with the game. Listen, I've, I've been in stadiums with thousands and thousands of people and they've called me all sorts. And to be fair, sometimes you have a bad game and they get on to you about that. That's football, isn't it? But there has to be an understanding that, you know what, football and being like, discriminating towards someone is very, very different. I think we need to understand the difference between the two. Mm. Well, it's funny because people always say, like, they've commented on my accent, but I can't understand you, what you're saying, da, da, da. And then you go, don't say that. Like, I don't play the racist card, but I'm like, don't say that. And they're like, oh, it's only casual racism. What the fuck is casual racism? Like, racism, racism, not <laughs> casual, it's racism. It's like, it cracks me up. No, and another thing that I've always felt strongly about is how racism, homophobia, you know, sometimes people in their head maybe prioritise it or think one is worse than the other. But actually, if you are a disabled football fan and you're being abused because you are a disabled football fan, that's no different to the other forms of discrimination. And I think this is something that people need to be aware of. Like, if you are being a horrible, abusive, to another individual, it's wrong. And I think sometimes, because the media touches on certain aspects of discrimination more so than others, I think we have to all appreciate that. Mm -hmm. When you are horrible, abusive, and you cross that line, 
and you're talking about someone's protected characteristic by law, it's the same. But I don't think personally that certain forms of abuse get anywhere near the, the kind of um, newspaper <laughs> headlines or the, or, the, or the media attention that they should do. And, and they should, because it's all the same to me. It's, all, it's, it's, exactly true, what you, it's true what you say, Anwar. They touch on it. They don't get to it because it took, like, it took the death of George Floyd to bring out this whole, like, Black Lives Matter, this whole marches. Then obviously the court case came up again and it was brought to the forefront again. But it's only when something massive happens that the media are interested and the social media are interested. It's not the little things. It's not the, it's not the everyday things that we experience. It seems to be like, obviously, it's a fatality. George Floyd has died as a result of this. And it's a fatality. So the media are all over it. But if he hadn't died, I wonder, would it just have been, oh, he was arrested, it doesn't matter. Like... You know, I don't know. They, oh, I was just saying, because they, they filmed it, mate. Huh? Because <laughs> it's on camera, that they, 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 you know, it happened. It's atrocious, isn't it? Nine minutes on somebody's neck, you know. It's this bit... is what I mean. If if it hadn't, if it hadn't been so high profile, and someone had, and it, it, I can't agree with video on that kind of carry on because it. The first thing people do now, they don't help anyone. They video them, and it fucking winds me up a treat. And that's why I've always said, if that happens at a game, that you think might be a fatality if you see someone with a mobile phone take it off them because when I'm finished dealing with them I will beat the person to death because I think imagine being that person's family watching that it's hard enough to listen to it after the aftermath but George Floyd's family saw that they heard it that's the horrific part like mm. it's hard enough to lose your son your brother your husband your father your whatever but imagine watching it hearing his voice I can't breathe come on like that's a whole nother level, you know. It's just it's oh. I think media will always look for the sensation, though, won't it? It's the biggest story. It's the most blown up story. It's not about your micro stories in between. Exactly. But I think I think football reflects society. I think at the moment society is very polarized. It feels like I don't think it is, and I think that it's it's been made for that. But I feel like football reflects what you see around you, doesn't it? So that's what that's the joy of football, isn't it? That it reflects the society we live in. Well, that's why I love the game because, you know, mm. like my dad came over here from Bangladesh and I played football. And I, you know, there's no one from my dad's country that's ever done this. Mm. Other than Hamza Chowdhury that's doing that now. And it's like, what other industry in this country could you have like, an opportunity to mm. earn lots of money, play in stadiums? And that's the beautiful thing about football, regardless of who you are, you know, it's an opportunity to have a great life, to experience some amazing things, meet great people playing fantastic stadiums but even that I don't think if you look at non-league for example does it represent the towns and cities in which we sit so like East London huge Asian community the grassroots teams in East London the non-league teams in East London do they have Asian representation not really so and you can go across the whole game um, people talk about the managers in the premiership in the EFL how many black managers do we have <laughs> How many women have we got working in the media industry? All these sort of things that we discuss, they need to slowly change. And I think it's taken us a very, very, it's really, really slow. And that's a worry for me because, like I said, the opportunity that football's given me has been amazing to meet people and do amazing things. That should be open for absolutely everyone. And you know what? You might not be good enough to play for West Ham United, but why not play for Emsley or Aldershot? And that, that's the thing that's always got me. I, I've never understood why. But what's your? I mean, we we were just saying there about you know more female coming through into into presenting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What's what's everybody's thoughts on the story that broke this week about Leighton Orient doing away with their with with their women's team? Well, what's the reason behind it? They just uh, no idea. I didn't all this. It was just big uproar on 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 social media. To the fact that they've actually done away with their lady, with, done away with their ladies team. They just turned up and said, "Right, that's it. We're not having a ladies team." That was it. Yeah, but to be fair, it, it, women's football has come a long, 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 long way. Even since I played, like it's come a long way. But on the same token, I still know managers who are managing at this moment in time who um, say, "Oh, all women who play football are lesbians." That's not true. Um, it's a waste of a pitch hire on a Sunday. That's also not true. It's like, it's, it's, women's football has a long, long way to go because 
no offence boys, David and Anwar, women's football has a long way to go because of old school mentality and this, oh, women shouldn't play football, women shouldn't be involved in football. It's still got hundreds of years to pro progress even further, but it's fantastic where it is at the moment, but it still has such a long, long way to go. I'm guessing, Dave, it was uh, financially driven that one, wasn't it, with uh, the changes to football clubs? Yeah, I think they must Sounds have been a bit important. financial to me. Yeah, but the no, saddest thing, I mean, I'm going to say a dirty word, guys. I apologize. Super League. <laughs> um, this is exactly what's happened, isn't it, in the week in the football. Money has spoken louder than anything else in football. That lasted long. <laughs> um, the pandemic was over as quick. But do you know, do you know what? I think it's, 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 it, 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 it shows the mentality of some higher ups in club, isn't it? That it's all about money and not about the society around their clubs. I think they underappreciate that. But I mean, problem with women football is the money behind it is not quite there yet, is it? So it's a natural, you know, naturally it's tempting, isn't it? I mean, I would say it's wrong. You know, I think it's it's only fair you give everybody a fair crack at the whip, but. Um, um, but yeah, I think a lot of that is, is financial. I think, yeah. I think you know what, for me, football clubs have, I think, like almost like a moral obligation to mm. serve the community. So, you know, when I grew up, we had like youth clubs and stuff. You could hang out and go and play table tennis. And the world has changed. So what's going to take the place of a church, a youth club, all these sort of places that people congregate in, is probably the nearest we're going to get is a football club. So, you know what, you might not have a women's team that are going to be world champions, but I'm sure it's not going to be that expensive to hire a pitch once a week, get a coach, who usually volunteer anyway, to have a women's team. Now, they may not be the best, but they still exist. And for those, for that squad, for the young, mm. young girls coming through, it's an opportunity, it's a pathway. So, for me, I think I'd like to see every team have a women's team. It doesn't have to be the best. And I think... Football's very competitive. If everyone has something, they want it to be the best. For me, first and foremost, as a club, serve your community. Mm -hmm. Like Get engaged with your community. Find out who lives locally. If there's a group of women that want to play, play under our badge. We'll give you some kit. We'll get some facilities. And I think, to be fair, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think sometimes, I mean, look, we've all worked in non-league. Mm -hmm. you know? In non-league, where there's a will, there's a way. Because half the time, there isn't the money. But we still manage to make it work by getting good people to volunteer to help and go above and beyond. So for me, I think it's possible if you really, really want it. And usually it goes down to maybe teams or the managers driving it themselves, which to be fair, if you look at a lot of teams, especially in grassroots, that's what that's what happens. But I think we need more help from our clubs in the community. You know, serve your community, help your community, and, and, and a women's team is a great way of doing that. So Anwar, at Aldershot, what's the backroom staff like? Is there women in the backroom staff or is it just male dominated? At Aldershot, it's, um, we have a skeleton crew, to be honest, because when we got the job, I got the call and uh, Gaffer rang me up. He said, we've just got a job. Um, do you fancy coming in with me? Aldershot, they've just been relegated to the National League South. So we went in, just myself and him, and the budget was, was, was pretty small. And I have a full-time job, so he was able to give me part-time money because that, that was all that we could do. We potentially looked at going part-time. So really, now Football League was what Aldershot was playing a few years ago. So we got a reprieve. Gates had went bust. So we were planning part-time National League South. All of a sudden, two weeks before the, end, the start of the season, we're in the National League. So there's only three of us, myself, the gaffer, and, and, and Michael Kukowitz, and we've got a, a new physio who's come in this year full-time, George. And we get lots of students who are, uh, we have analysts and physios who um, are both male and female. We have, I think, eight in the, in, in, uh, in the staff and it's a split four on four. So to be honest, we would, we would encourage anyone to come and help us out. But unlike most clubs at our level, our resources are really, really um, limited. And to be fair, with, with like the physio position, I think sometimes clubs have gone, we'll just get any physio in, but actually physios are important and they need to be paid accordingly. I think you can't cut corners because if you're a player coming to sign for Aldershot, we want to make sure that, you know, you're looked after. So we're trying to do the best we can with the resources that we've got, but we, um, we, 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 we're very diverse in terms of our makeup. And that's, that's not something that we kind of like doing on purpose. It's just the way we are, because ultimately, if anyone wants to come and help us, to be honest, I don't care who you are, where you're from, like we need the help. So that's the kind of ethos at the club, really. That wasn't, about... stick, that wasn't a stitch up, that was just a genuine inquiry. <laughs> <laughs>
So talking about talking about physios and stuff, uh, what was Madam like when you were, when she was working under you? Yeah, good, good. I thought she was a a, a she complimented the club. It was really good, and she done things properly, and that's the main thing. I think I think sometimes, like I mentioned, you know, when you when you go to especially non league clubs, I think like they there's certain parts of non league clubs that people think they can cut corners at. I don't ever think that those sort of areas of the club you should. I think it's something that we need to take seriously because it's probably the most serious aspect of the game. But yeah, she was brilliant um, for me. And uh, but she decided to leave to go to a better league and a better club. So you can't, you know, we, you can't. We you can't both know game. that's not true. <laughs> deep, deep glory hunters, Anwar. It's ruining the game. <laughs> no, well, tell, I'm getting used to it now. Even at Aldershot, we find these rough diamonds. We bring them in. We work with them. A year later, all the top clubs want them. I mean, it's like, see you later. Thank you very much, Anwar. And, um, yeah, so yeah, that was uh, that was my experience with her. She went to a bigger club, better league, and um, just got to deal with it, haven't you? Yeah. Right. Okay. So now, now I'll mute. I know you can tell us all the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On my last game with Anwar, to be fair to him, he said, "Boys, assembly's last game. She can do the team talk, and we won." <laughs> Yeah, I'm going, to try, I'm going to get you on the phone for all the shot now because if we've had a couple of games where we have on one, I'm going to get right, boys, hold it there. I'm going to do a FaceTime. Hold it there, guys. <laughs> Zoom God. Yes, yeah, team talk on one. There you go, mate. Quality. So what, what was it? What was it like down at? What was it like down at Brentwood? Glebe. 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 Sorry, Glebe. Sorry, Glebe. No, it was quite. I loved it. It was my local team. Uh, literally the closest club to my house. Um, and with with doing the job that I'm doing, it's quite difficult to kind of, you know, like with most non-league clubs, I know there's certain managers in non-league that literally they travel two, three hours on a Tuesday and Thursday night. And I was doing that when I was at Morden and Tiptree and where. And then when I um, met Rocky at Glebe, it was local, it was a lovely club, good people, good facilities. And I thought I'd give it a go. And it was, I had a, I had a, I had a cracking time actually. It was a really good club. And I still speak to the people down at the club now. Mm. Are you, are you surprised management-wise in non-league? This all of a sudden a lot of jobs coming up very, very quickly. So I mean, today I've just seen today. Of course, there's you know there's, there's been the likes of Cray recently. There's been the likes of Lewis lately. There's, and now again today there's been sort of Wingate and Finchley, uh, and it's also Northwood as well that have, that uh, have also sort of advertising for managers. Are you surprised that all of a sudden, especially in this sort of pandemic when we're not playing any games, these people lo- people are sort of losing their jobs before the you know, before the new season gets underway. Yeah, I'm slightly surprised. It's the timing is is curious. However, I mean, for me, I just feel like sometimes stability is important. And I think we, we, we're not seeing that a lot in the game. I think the average tenure in the English Football League currently is like 16 months. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've had the fortunate to play for loads of teams around my career. I would go to a team like Sheffield Wednesday, buy a house, and then the manager would bring me in and say, I'm selling you to Bristol Rovers. So then you rent the place, you go and go to another club. And I went to Bristol Rovers and I lived in a hotel for six months because I didn't want to buy a house because I knew the minute I bought a house, they'd get rid of me because it happened at West Ham and Sheffield Wednesday. But I think stability is key. I think where you look at some of the non-league teams over the last few years, there's been some teams that have had some great success and that's that comes with a core of players or management. So, yeah, strange, but... Listen, it's tough times, isn't it? So there's a lot of probably circumstances that we don't actually know about. But what a great opportunity. I'd encourage anyone to uh, to get down into non-league and, 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 and have a go at managing even as low as step five. It's, it's a good adventure, but ultimately it's a great place to learn. But, you, I mean, you said about being tough. I mean, it couldn't be much tougher this week, could it? I mean, Torquay away, and now you're going to end up playing yeah. Sutton away. I mean, top two in, in, in league and back-to-back. Yeah, seriously, Tuesday night, talking away, I literally, I, I wouldn't advise anyone to do that. It was, and when we got, the referee put up five minutes of added time and they scored in a 98th minute. So, you, you know, you do the maths, but that journey home was tough. Got it, got in bed at 5 a.m. and had a nine o'clock Zoom meeting, which was brilliant. I, I turned my camera off for that meeting. Mm. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but um, no, it's a tough one, but listen, this is why we do it. You know, it's about taking on the best teams. Uh, we've got a young squad at Aldershot. I think we're one of the youngest in the league. And to be honest, on that day, we, we, we're a match for anyone. So I used to play for Sutton. So I'm going to enjoy going back there. And it's nowhere near as far as talking. So I'm pretty happy with that. 
I mean, these fixtures, I've just, I've just having a quick look at them. I mean, it's, it's almost as if someone's really don't like you all of a sudden, isn't it? I mean, it's like talk, talk of United away, Sutton away. Then it's not too bad. You've got Yeovil at home. Then you've got Hartlepool. I mean, that's, it's just, don't get any easier, does it? No, it's, it's probably the hardest four games you could uh, you could have. But, yeah, it, that's the way it works sometimes. But, I mean, I've been, I mean, the last couple of months, I've been to Halifax away on a Tuesday night. I've been up to, um, I think we played some at Kings Lynn on a Tuesday night. Like, you're getting home at like three, four in the morning and um, it's tough. Um, the pandemic's been, the only good thing about the pandemic has been the traffic because obviously no one in the cars. But now all of a sudden, went to Aldershot this morning and all of a sudden there's, there's traffic on the M25. It's taking me twice as long. So, yeah, it's uh, going to be a long six weeks. And then you've got Eastley and Bromley. I mean, it's just like... You know, come on, fixture list, give us a break, can it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a weird season though, because obviously no one can go down this year, and it's just it's probably the strangest season I think anyone would ever ever be involved in. You know, there's no relegation, so you've got half the league trying to go up, you've got half the league just happy to be around and furloughing players, and you know, there's some weird scores that you see in the national league because I guess it's weird if you're in the bottom half. You know, what's your motivation? You've got half the team on furlough. You know, so it's it's strange, and then you've got half the team obviously the league trying to win win the league. So we're competitive in every single game. Um, like I said, we're playing all the top teams, so we don't want to sort of um, you know ruin the integrity of the league. But to be honest, I'm looking forward to the next year when all of non-league is is back and alive and kicking because I've missed it. I've missed being able to go to a step two or step three game and see if there's any potential players that we can we can take at all the shot, and um, not been able to do that this year. Well, you might have a nice trip to got a nice trip to Grimsby, I suppose. That's one good thing next year, and and maybe even South End. Yes, at one point I thought Barrow and Grimsby were going to come down, so <laughs> I was thinking that's two long trips for us. But um, yeah, it looks like South End uh, will be joining us potentially. Which, to be fair, huge, huge club. I mean, you look at them and Notts County, Wrexham. You know, they're they're up against the likes of us and and Wildstones. It's uh, it's, it's it's a brilliant league to be involved in and. You know, I'd encourage anyone in non-league that's working in the lower leagues to sort of work towards getting up to the National League because it's still non-league. But listen, when you're playing against South End and Notts County, it doesn't feel like non-league. Mm. Do you think Dover will struggle, struggle next year even further being part-time? Yes, I think they will. I think it's very difficult to compete with the top teams if you're part-time. You think, you, you know, you're training every day. I mean, some of the facilities, I had a look at some of the clubs, Solihull Moors and the Wrexhams and Stockport. You know, I had a look at some of the training facilities this year and wow, like, they're amazing. They're like Football League Championship standard. And then you've got other clubs that are hiring out of 4G on a Tuesday and a Thursday night. So, but that's why I love the National League because you literally, it's David and Goliath every single week. And um, I think it'll be hard for Dover, but they're a plucky little club that always seem to, to do okay. Um, and I like them being in the league because it's a Kent club and it's not too far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was really lucky because I had a little bit of work experience with them during lockdown. When our league finished, uh, when our season finished, I was like, uh, can I come and work for you? And they were like, yeah, fine. And um, I got to experience a trip to Wrexham and Kings Lane and Yeovil. And I was gutted because Wrexham is such a cool stadium. I was like, it's empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really wanted to experience the atmosphere. Now the fans have been missed this year. I think that's uh, oh, that's been the massive. biggest disappointment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you get to see Ryan Reynolds when he went to Wrexham? Uh, no, but um, apparently there was a guy following the show with a camera, so I think that was that it was part of a Netflix thing. So if you see someone who looks a bit homeless, that's definitely me. <laughs> it was shattered. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was fun. I mean, it was it was fun, and it was such an experience to to make those journeys um, and to travel like on the coaches, like the proper coaches. I think we had Sheffield Wednesday's coach, and I was like, "This is a bit of me. Can we yeah. keep this coach at oh, Phoenix?" Some of the coaches are amazing. We had Crystal Palace's coach the other night. You had the sofa, the kitchen. Oh, yeah. We had a kitchen, it was me. I was like, what is this situation? Messed in the gaffer, gaffer! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no, I did, it took me back to the days when I was at West Ham when we was traveling in, uh, in, in luxury. When I was at West Ham, we actually had a chef on the coach as well. So when you're a bit peckish, you know, you ask the chef for a little bit of something and he'd 
conjure something up all nice and healthy for you. So yeah, those those days are well and truly behind me then. We definitely didn't have a chef, but the boys were quite kind. They made me a cup of coffee, so I can't really complain. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, for, for for Ali's sort of sake, I mean, what was West Ham like playing for West Ham? You know what? It was um, it was the best experience of my life because I chose to go to West Ham because, in hindsight, it was probably the worst decision ever because they had the best kids in the world. So when I went there, they were like, "Amwar, come and join us. We've got Michael Carrick, Joe Cole, Glenn Johnson, Jermaine Defoe, Frank Lampard, Rio Ferdinand," and I was like. Like, you want to be the best, you've got to be around the best. But then when I broke into the first team squad at 18, I got a, a pro contract. I had Rio in front of me, Stuart Pearce, Ian Pearce, Steve Potts. There were so many good players. And like, I was waiting for Rio to have a bad game. It just never happened. Um, and when I was at West Ham that season, when I made when I was in the first team squad, I finished fifth in the Premier League. We had Paolo Di Canio, Trevor Sinclair, Freddie Canute. And it was just, it was an amazing time to be at the club because they were literally like such a good side with so many good players. But for a young player, unless you were Joe Cole, Jermaine Defoe, Michael Carrick, it was, it was not an impossible. Yeah. So I literally, I waited for a year, two years, and I ended up having to go to Sheffield Wednesday in a championship just because they were at West Ham at that point were on another level. And I, I always think back now, I mean, we won that FA Youth Cup final 9-0 in the final over two legs, 9-0. And that was just because literally, like, I played centre half. I didn't even have to do anything. Joe Cole, Leon Britton, Michael Carrick, they just, just had a bit of a party. But I look back now and you think, if West Ham kept all of those players, I'm telling you now, they would have been serious, serious contenders for a long time. We're back now, though, Anwar. It's fine. Yeah, no, yeah. It's taken a while. <laughs> Thank you. Who's the best Ham player you play against, play? Anwar, if I'm asking? Who's the best player you think you played with? I think the best player I played with was probably Joe Cole. I don't think people mm. got to see the best of him. When he was a kid, he literally was, it was like he was playing in the playground. We'd play, you know, we'd go to games and we'd play like, we'd play Norwich and we'd be 7-0 and Joe would score six. And it was just like, it, it was actually like unfair having him in the team because he was so good. You know how like Lionel Messi is, he'd get the ball and take three or four players on. Joe was just magnificent. And then if you add to the kind of the team, the Carricks and the Defoe's, mm. We were just, it was just so good. But I look back now and I think, had I gone to someone like a Norwich, an Orient, a South End, you know, I could have probably got closer to the first team squad and maybe played more games. But you know what? No, it's priceless to be around that 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 environment for two, three years. You know, going every day, sitting next to the candy on one side, Thomas Repka on one side. You know, like my um, I my, I had a different roommates. So I roomed with Joe Cole. I roomed with Thomas Repka, who was an absolute lunatic. I'm going to ask you, what was he like to room with? <laughs> yeah, like, Thomas Repka would go to the, um, say, come on, we're going. So we'd go and have a walk to the petrol station. He'd buy four Red Bulls, go to bed, drink four Red Bulls, and then sleep. I would was, I was sit there and think to myself, that's not normal. And then he'd wake up and then literally go and play a game and get sent off. But um, So I roomed with him, Paul Kitson. Uh, Gary Charles. I mean, it was just for a young player. This is like what you dream about doing. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, I was. It was disappointing not to sort of go on and play loads of games for West Ham. But listen, the standard of players that we had was just, you know. So for me, it was just a privilege to be there every day. Well, it's funny because I was watching him. I don't know what I was watching, but it was when um, De Canio took the ball off Frank Lampard. Frank was on pens, and De Canio wrestled the ball out of his hands. And I wonder if you would be on pens. Would you have stepped back and let the Canio take it or would you have stood your ground? No, uh, listen, you've got to let the Canio do whatever he wants to do. I tackled the Canio once in training and he didn't like it. So when he got to the car park, I bought, I had a brand new Renault Clio, which to me was like, you know, I've made it. I've got a new, new Renault Clio because uh, I tackled him and he didn't like it. He, uh, the next day he brought in the club car that they got for free and he reversed it into my Clio and then drove away and said, you coming behind tackling me is the same as me doing that to you. So don't ever do it again. So yeah. <laughs> but uh, but he, he came back the next day and gave me some money to, 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 to get it done. But that that is Paolo. He was Paolo. You don't don't mess with Paolo. Paolo's Paolo. So. To be fair, when I watched that clip, I thought fair play to Frank because he did stand his ground to an extent, but you could see him going, 
do I don't I you could, and I was just like mate just give him the ball just give him the ball he, um, he, he won one game Paolo actually uh, he just sat down and told Harry Redknapp to take him off that, that was that game off? yeah that was that game it was Bradford. Like, yeah Bradford and then he got off the, the, the fans started cheering him he got off and played on and scored <laughs> Yeah, no, but listen, Paolo was unbelievable. I always remember, like, when he, because um, he'd always shave, he'd always shave, and he had unbelievable tattoos, and he just, he just looked meticulous every day. He'd come in like he was just got off a fashion show. He'd come in with glasses and long jackets, and yeah, listen, I mean, like I said, I could have gone to another club and maybe had more of a footballing, like, better life, but being in the changing room with Neil Ruddock, John Monker, and Paolo, and all that, like, those things, Kind of made me a little. That's probably why I'm a little bit crazy now of being being involved in that sort of sort of environment. But I think when you sort of around that environment, you can kind of deal with anything because it's just like this is what you dream about doing. That's a what fantastic ma- experience then. What made you go into management, though, Anwar? Um, to be fair, it was almost like so when I was at Barnet, I was the captain of the club, and I just had a really bad injury. I sort of broke my left ankle, so I was going to be out for a very long time. So about six months into that, Martin Allen came in and literally, I've never met Martin Allen before in my life, but obviously- You really have been surrounded by lunatics. (laughs) (laughs) So Martin Allen comes in and he makes a few phone calls the night before, speaks to Harry Redknapp, speaks to Peter Braybrook, speaks to Roger Cross, all West Ham coaches. And they say, get Anwar on side, he's he's a top lad. Literally the next day he comes in and tells me I'm his assistant manager. And basically every single day after that, he was just bossing me around. And then one day he came in and left the Notts County, just went and said, you come in. I said, after I've got another year left on my contract. So he left and I kind of took charge of Barnet. We were bottom of the league. Um, <laughs> never been in that position before, nothing to lose. So I took over and a friend of mine, Giuliano Grazioli, came in and helped. And we, we kept him up on the last day of the season. And so f- from that, kind of accidentally, I was like, just kept Barnet in the football league. And all I did was got the music on every day, five sides, just tried to lift the place. We stayed up. And then I thought to myself, this is all right. I want to I wanna try and do this. So I did all my badges. And yeah, that, that was the kind of start of my journey. Um, and from there, what? They, they, from there to Malden and Tiptree? Yeah, there to Malden and Tiptree. I also went to West Ham's academy. So West Ham wanted me to come in as academy coach. And then obviously I've got this job that I'm doing now. So I tried to stay part time because to complement my job, which meant like literally having meetings at Arsenal, jumping in my car, getting changed in the car, jumping out and like doing a session at Ware or more than at Glee and sort of doing both jobs. But um, yeah, we done really well. And then I went to Maidstone um, after Glee with John Steele and Hakan just to do a bit of scouting. And then uh, now I'm at Aldershot, I've been here two years. So I'm, at least I'm very fortunate because I get to do two things I absolutely love. But yeah, every day is a busy. So about your diversity job though, did, how did that come about? So yeah, so look, I am um, 17, tw- I'd say 20 years I was playing football and I was always asked, and what? Why is there such a lack of Asian people playing football? Why is there such a lack of Asian people watching football? 20 years I was asked the same question constantly. So when I retired, I thought to myself, I'm going to try and do something about it. And I remember when I, I used to play at Bradford, right? Bradford, I don't know if you've ever been there, massive stadium. 13,000 fans every single home game. Season tickets are really cheap. But around Bradford, there is a huge Asian population. I'm talking huge around the stadium. 98% Bangladeshi. You go into a game on a match day, not one Asian face. So for six years, literally corners and throws, I'd be looking at the crowd going, is there any Asians here? Do you know what I mean? Just because I was curious. Now I'm no Lionel Messi, but I'm thinking, if you're a young Asian world girl and you want to play football, there's, a, there's an Asian player playing, go and, watch, go and watch the game. So when I got this job, Bradford was one of the first places I went to, and I went into the community actually asked them, why don't you go and watch the games? And they used to say to me, and while we've had bricks through our window, racist chants, we've been beaten up, so we just keep sort of them and us with the fans. Long story short, we created a fans group called the Bangla Bantams. They went once a month, then twice a month. And now they've got 600 members with 150 season ticket holders. And I've been to games with like Asian women in hijabs. And I remember the last game I went to with, uh, with auntie, played Rochdale on a Tuesday night. Rochdale scored and she celebrated because she didn't know what colour Bradford played and what colour <laughs> Rochdale played. But that was because the Asian community is sort of connecting with, with Bradford for the first time. So, 
yeah, so that's a little bit of kind of the work I do now, kind of getting more people watching football and just enjoying football, which is, which is obviously I'm, I'm, I feel really proud to be doing that. I mean, is that, is that a case though, you know, with the Asian uh, people though? I mean, is it a case with that they're more into the sort of like the cricket? Because I mean, I used to work in Tesco uh, for Tesco's and manager there, and I would say a good ninety percent of my staff there were were, were Asian uh, uh, lads and and, and 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 ladies, and but. Every single one of them, you speak to them about football, and they go, nah, "No idea." But the minute you mentioned cricket, they were on it like a ton of bricks. You could sit there and talk to them for about six months about cricket, and it wouldn't be a major issue. Is, is, is that a, is that a sort of a, a, the issue as well? No, I mean, listen, cricket is massive in Bangladesh and India and Pakistan, but I think to be honest, football has never been something that they've, they've looked at as a viable career. Mm-hmm. If you if you're a young Asian kid and you say, "Well, I want to be a football player," and you say to your mum and dad, "I want to be a football player," they'll go. Well, well, how many Asians are playing football? You go, well, none. All right, I want to be a coach. Why? How many Asians are playing? So it's almost like, is that a viable career? Is that something I can do? And, and, and the answer to that question is, yes, it is. But there's, there's a lack of confidence with some communities in football. They don't believe that there's an opportunity to play. There's all the barriers like racism um, and other barriers. So I think, listen, the appetite for football in this country is huge for the Asian community. I just think there's a lack of trust. And I think that's slowly starting to change. Because look, I don't care where you live, some of the grassroots communities, huge Asian populations, not just Asians, could be Eastern Europeans, but do they does that reflect the teams like in non-league, in the football league? It doesn't. So there's a lot of work to be done, but I think that will change over time. I'm gonna ask a really, really ignorant question. So I do apologize before I ask it. Um, is it um is it anything? anything to do with religion that sport is not massive or is it just that it's just not massive? No, I, think, I think religion, I don't think that's all. I mean, like, for example, at the moment, it's the, it's the holy month of Ramadan. It's Muslims. Ramadan, yeah. So for Muslim players, they're fasting. So the likes of El Neni at Arsenal and a few others will be fasting every single yeah. day for a month. Now, obviously, that will have an effect on their performance, but Muslim players play football all over the world. So mm. there are aspects of religion that may make your experience playing, coaching or managing different. different but, it yeah. shouldn't, it should, but it shouldn't be a barrier. So for me, I think it's about having an understanding of difference and actually saying you're all welcome. So regardless of, listen, for me, there's no openly gay football player in, in this country. The only player who came out as, as gay was Thomas Hisselsberger, who did what, so when he retired. How many gay football players have we missed out on that could have potentially played for England or some of our local clubs. Really, really good players over the years. But they've chosen not to engage with the sport because they feel it's not welcome enough. How many young Asian players have probably felt like it's not a safe environment? The environment, the team, the management, the way it is. Over the years, there's probably some superstars that we missed out on. So that's that. That's gone. But for me, it's about making sure that that doesn't happen again. So in your community, if you're a local team, a non-league team, and you've got an Asian community in your area or any community for that matter, engage, make sure everyone can play. And, you know, sometimes we see that in our junior teams. You know, you look at the junior teams and there's loads of black and Asian kids. It's brilliant. You go to the first team level and it starts to dwindle and lumber really, really, really low. So I think there's some work there, which is, which is what, what I try to do. Um, am, but, am I, am I, do you think it needs it needs a player to come out of the blue from somewhere? If it's some, if there's a young Asian uh, player in the, in an academy somewhere in a Premiership academy or whatever, that it just it just needs that sort of like a, a Harry Kane type of player or, or something along those sort of lines, you know, to come through, and that would then bring a lot more Asian players into the game if they see somebody you know, think, that comes in and yeah, stuff really makes it. A role model is important, but it's not the be and end all. So Hamza Chowdhury at the moment, playing for Leicester. He's a uh, mixed heritage. Um, Michael Chopra has played for Newcastle. Jan Danders currently at Swansea. Danny Bart is at uh, Stoke. So we've had Jess Remen play for Fulham in the Premier League. So we've had players, but not enough. Um, but for me, it's not just, we're talking about the Asian experience because I mentioned the Brad- Bradford case study, but... Look at football. Does football represent society? No, it doesn't. So I'm not saying it's going to overnight because for a long time it's been very male orientated, but it is slowly starting to change. And like, you know, everyone on this call, like you're, you're in football and you might be unique because there's, there's very few physios, there's very few women in the game. But I think it takes people to do 
be in that environment to, to suddenly make people realize that this is how it is. And, and slowly we'll see more women, more Asian, more, more openly gay players. I mean, a friend of mine's an openly gay coach in non-league. It's the first of his kind, but now there's someone that's there where it hasn't been before. So things are changing for the better. And don't get me wrong, you know, the girls have mentioned earlier about being thick skinned. Like, listen, some of the things I had to deal with and hear and listen to throughout my career, I look back now and I think, why would anyone have to deal with that? But yeah. when you go from an environment that's very much one way and then you want to change it, there's that transition in between. And I think mm -hmm. us on the call have been part of that transition. And I think, you know, your role models because there's certain things that you've all had to probably deal with and listen to that are probably not appropriate. But over time, that suddenly it becomes normal to have a female physio. It becomes normal to have a, a female coach or women in the club that work in that environment. Whereas before, yeah. that wasn't the case. I mean, one of the things that I, th I thought was really good this week as well, you're talking about the, you know, the Holy Month of Ramadan and that. And I'm sure I saw a couple of games where there was a break uh, in, in one of the games where an injury or, or something along those sort of lines and they were allowing... Uh, guys that were fasting to actually sort of take on water and take on sort of energy fluid yeah. drinks and stuff like that, which I thought was a small plus, sort of a smooth. Yeah, first, you know, the yeah. first time ever in England that's ever happened. So in Muslim countries, like in the Turkish league, when players break their fast, it's usually around 8.05, for example, the game would stop. Never happened in England, but on the game on Monday evening, you had three Muslim players so to do that was amazing. Now, some people might go, well, why is that? But that shows support and solidarity for those players that were fasting. That shows them that English football, English people care about what you're going through and we want to support you on that journey. So for me, that was a, that was a massive thing. But it's those small things for me that if we can continue to do, raise awareness of what a player is going through, how can we help and then do something like we did on Monday, I think is a, is a brilliant way. And that would never happen five, 10 years ago. Mm. That was the FA Medical Society's um, theme subject this month. I was on a Zoom last Thursday, I think it was, and they did a whole um, three hours on, because Ramadan doesn't normally fall during the football season, so they don't have to worry about it or like consider it. Whereas this is the first year it's fallen during the season. So they had like... Um, nutritionists and all that on talking about how it affects them their sleep how, when they have to wake how they could how they hydrate without hydrating to the point where they're going to wake up in the night time to go to the toilet so that they rest easy um and they had the only player they had on to talk about it which i was totally delighted about was sonny bill williams the key um the all black but i thought it was interesting they didn't interview any players but i don't know if that's because it's during the season and they're not allowed to do interviews i didn't know but I just, he was the only one that came on and spoke about his experience of fasting and playing elite football. And it was really, really interesting. And it's the first time I ever thought, oh yeah, actually people do sport, um, celebrate Ramadan and play sports. And it was because it was brought to my attention, I would never have thought of it otherwise. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, it's about raising awareness, having these discussions. And ultimately, you know, when you're fasting from, you know, dawn to sunset, it's, it's a challenge and you've got to go and play in the Premier League as well. So, you know, my, my, I'll, I'll tip my hat off to anyone that can do that and still maintain that level. It's an amazing achievement. Mm. It was just so interesting how they managed the players. It was so, so interesting. Mm. Absolutely. Well, all I can say is, you wouldn't believe this, but that hour has flown by. Absolutely flown by. I, I've got to, I know, I've, I've probably enjoyed it, I'll be honest with you. I was just sitting there listening to uh, to and and you ladies and uh, it's been a fantastic uh, an hour to sit and listen to you, and a massive thank you to you, Anwar, for, for coming on. No, no problem. And, uh, and uh, hopefully last. we can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and hopefully we can speak to you again very soon uh, when we start back. But uh, me and the girls will be back on Friday, and uh, we'll be back for our last show of the current series, and we'll be back for that on Friday, um, and then we'll be back in August of uh, this year as well with the with the second season of the Epping Bag Show. So a massive thank you to Anwar. A massive thank you to, of course, uh, two of the Charlie's Angels, of course, and a uh, massive thank you to both of you, Ali, and to Emily for your time again tonight. And as I said, support these ladies. When this football season starts, it's going to be starting before we come back for our new series. Don't forget to support the likes of the, the ladies that are here on the show because without them, we wouldn't have football if we didn't have them with us. So uh, please sure remember, 
May Skin Cancer Awareness Month, so please get checked. Yeah, absolutely. And congratulations on your anniversary as well once Thanks. again. But uh, until until Friday, from, from everybody here, good night. Bye.